Hi, Good guys. morning, everybody. I gotcha. Yeah, you got my glasses Jensen. on it. Yeah, oh, you beat me. I beat you. Oh, he I didn't know. I didn't know it was a contest. Me. Oh, yes, you do know it's a contest. <laughs> Everything's a contest for you, isn't it? <laughs> Just a little Just bit. Just a little though. bit. Yes, yeah. yes. It's a, that's a side of Patty. Some of you know. Some of you may not know. Yep. Yep. She's 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 pretty competitive. Hey, but for nine months, the only person that I could kind of have competition with is you. And but you just made me into one big loser for the last oh, nine months. Oh, that is, is not that true. It? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. You beat me on you everything. You like to compete and you like to win. That is so true. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so here's where we are. So we are um, obviously resuming our journey through Genesis today. Um, looking ahead, we will finish Genesis next Monday. So Tuesday, we'll finish Genesis next Tuesday. So two weeks from today, we're going to begin Paul's letter to the Ephesians in my Tuesday class. We're going to go jump to the New Testament. It's kind of how I like to do it is to go back and forth. And so we're going to go to the letter, Paul's letter to the Ephesians in my Tuesday class two weeks from today. My Monday class, interestingly, this is just coincidence. This was Don't imagine there's any, any great planning behind it. But Matthew is going to wrap up also next week. Monday so consequently my my Monday class is going to start something new and we're going to start the book of Exodus so um and we're going to particularly focus on coming to know God through the book of Exodus that's what the last sermon series was about but there's only so much you can do in a teaching way in a sermon series so we're going to really come to know God in a way that we might not have before through the book through the story of the Exodus so if you want, I know we're finishing Genesis. If you want to continue on in Exodus, you could join us on Mondays at 3 p.m. Or you could listen to the podcasts. Or you could go to YouTube and watch the video of the Monday class. So there's a lot of ways to do it. So anyway, that's what the plan is. So two weeks from today, yeah. we'll be starting Paul's letter to the Ephesians. This magnificent, um, really a circulating letter that he wrote. And one you haven't Christians. done like this. In a long, I've never long done Ephesians time. on Monday or Tuesday. You, I look yes. back over the list we, where we go through every every verse. Right. We won't do every verse in Exodus because you get toward the end and it's just like so repetitive as they're building the tabernacle and they're telling you how many stitches are taken in every curtain practically. They tell you how it's supposed to be done and then, then they tell you that they did it in exactly that way. So I sort of get the theology. We'll explore some of that but ephesians will read every verse it will take a while it's it's not nothing like genesis or matthew in terms of length but it's just so rich you know so what else is new with you well i was just going to ask people today if you had any ideas to help me with something in addition to being very competitive i also have a guilt complex about everything. People sometimes say I am the sorriest person they've ever met because I'm constantly saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm That's sorry. That's because you went to Sister That's... Mary of the Weeping Willow School <laughs> up in Staten Island, right? That may be it. <laughs> that may be it. It might be the Catholic guilt. I'm not sure. But this time of year, I run down to get the mail. The mailbox is full. There is maybe a magazine, maybe most of the, ba the, the bills, you know, don't come that way anymore. Um, and there is like 10 envelopes from different charities. And I'm very faithful to certain charities. I've given to them for years, years. It's, you know, Wounded Warriors, one of my favorites, and March of Dimes. I don't know why. I just sort of pick different ones. And Shriners Hospital, because if you guys have seen the commercials, I love little Caleb. I love that child. And, but there is every type of cancer and you guys know that i truly cancer is so close to my heart there's heart associations there is toys for tots veterans 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 of foreign war uh, i just i never sent to veterans of foreign war but now the envelope is on my desk to pay them something because last week they sent me two pairs of socks unsolicited <laughs> in the mail <laughs> I've gotten more Christmas cards that I don't have to buy Christmas cards this year. We have so many, so many personalized Patty or Patricia Ingle <laughs> notepads. And, and I've stickers, got address stickers, address stickers. labels. Oh my gosh. So. You know why all those are there? 
to make me envelope. feel guilty. Right, you trigger your guilt complex. And that's exactly. what's that's what Scott says, honey. You just have, just close your eyes and throw them in the trash, and I can't do it. So somebody, please tell me, how how do you do it? How, you know, how do you how do you decide which ones, and especially when they've gone like crazy and sent you. You need a support group. I need a need. support group. <laughs> If any of you want to be in my support group, we could text each other and, like, I don't know, make little ceremonies as we carry over all the freebie stuff to the trash. Oh, man. Anyway, anyway, it's just that time of year, and it's every single day. And it all comes and to me. And we just want to make Jesus None of them happy. comes to you. I well, don't know Well, they know why we have that is. same guilt complex. <laughs> why send it to me? That would be a waste of money. No, you are the target. <laughs> So okay, anyway, okay. Let's get going. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here today. And it's cold out and it's windy and rainy and miserable, but we know that we are yours and that we come here together as a fellowship created by your Holy Spirit. And we are grateful for that. We're grateful that we can come together in this way to study this book of Genesis. And we pray as we do every time we gather that your Holy Spirit would open these pages up for us. Help us to hear something new. Help us to gain a deeper understanding of who you are and who we are and your work in this world. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Patty. Miss Guilty. I'm going over to my stack of envelopes <laughs> yes. sitting here waiting for checks to be written. <laughs> That's it. That is it. <laughs> okay, so... All right, friends, we are in Genesis, and we are in chapter 48 of Genesis. So let me catch things up for a little bit, okay? So we spent recent weeks going through the story of Joseph and his brothers, and we won't rehash all that. But now Joseph and his brothers are reconciled. Jacob, the whole tribe, is down in Egypt because they've come there fleeing um, the famine, and we know that in... in um, it's really this was this whole story was used by God to basically save um, Jacob's family, the family of Abraham. And so they're all in Egypt now. And Jacob is really old. And it has come time for him to bless his sons. Just like, if you remember, um, with Isaac, we got the story of Isaac wanting to bless his eldest son Esau. And that blessing was stolen by Jacob and his mother, Rebekah, conniving against Isaac. So these blessing stories are important. And this is, this is a blessing story here. Um, and it parallels the blessing story um, of Esau and Jacob as well. So a couple, we, we did start chapter 48 last week and got a ways into it. Um, but there was one thing I didn't bring out because it didn't hit me at the time. And... But I was reading some more um, about this story this week, and it was brought out. I said, that's a really good, good, good point. So just to review, Joseph, who has been in Egypt for a long time, married an Egyptian woman. And he has two sons, um, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. And these two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are obviously half Hebrew and half Egyptian. But they are Joseph's two sons. And so Joseph um, is going to bring those two sons to Jacob to participate in this blessing that Jacob wants to give all of his sons. So when 40, the chapter 48 opens, we remember that, you know, Joseph hasn't really been visited by God in the sense of God showing up and saying, Joseph, you know, your family's going to be X, Y, Z. He doesn't, he doesn't know the promise that was given to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the same way that those three men knew it. And so Jacob is going to have to tell Joseph about this great, great promise. So look at verse 3. Let's just go back there. Jacob said to Joseph, El Shaddai, God Almighty, appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me. And he said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and increase your number. I will make you a community of peoples. And I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. So it's a form of the same promise made to Abraham, made to Isaac, made to Jacob. Now Jacob is making sure that Joseph understands this promise because the promise is going to pass from Jacob to his sons. 
And I think we could surmise that Jacob has already imparted the nature of this promise to his other sons, but obviously never had the chance to with Joseph because he went off to slavery in Egypt. But look what he goes on to say. He says, Now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. So Jacob elevates these two sons of Joseph, half Hebrew, half Egyptian, elevate these two sons of Joseph into the same position as Reuben and Simeon and Levi and all the others. Right? But that isn't really the end of it here. He says, any children born to you after them will be yours. In the territory they inherit, they will be reckoned under the names of their brothers. Okay? Um, As I was returning from Paddan to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan while we were still on the way, a little distance from Ephrath, so I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. So look at verse um, uh, 5 again. He has elevated Ephraim and Manasseh to the same position as Reuben and Simeon. And so the point is that Joseph is getting in, going to get, in essence, a double portion. Does that make sense, Patty? Yes. He's going to get a double portion because it's going to be divided up amongst all these sons. And Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are holding Joseph's place. So Joseph, in essence, gets two portions when things are all divided, which makes Joseph, in a sense, the firstborn son. Right? You remember all this firstborn stuff that goes back where the firstborn sons get the double inheritance and they get the double blessing and, and that's, yep, that's what, what he saw, what Jacob was after. But now it's Joseph who in a sense is elevated above his brothers. He's not the firstborn by far in terms of birth order, but now he's like he's put into this firstborn position. And I think it just reflects the fact that jo that Jacob has so much affection for Joseph because he had so much affection for Rachel and and so here in the same paragraph that he elevates um, Ephraim and Manasseh and in essence then elevates Joseph above his brothers in that sense becoming the firstborn um, we also hear about Rachel who's buried near Bethlehem and that tomb is uh, what is remembered as that tomb is there today it's been a point of great contention at the very holy site in Judaism, and it's also important in Islam, um, the tomb of Rachel. So, let's just go back, gotta go on to verse 8. When Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he asked, who are these? They are the sons God has given me here, Joseph said to his father, and Israel said, bring them to me so I may bless them. Verse 10, just like Isaac, Israel's eyes were failing because of old age, and he could hardly see. You really can't miss the parallels oh, here, no. can you? So Joseph brought his sons, the two of them, close to him, and his father kissed them and embraced them. And Israel, that is Jacob, said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and now God has allowed me to see your children too. Again, the writer of this portion of, of Genesis, it's, it's just um, writes these stories with such great poignancy. I have on my shelf books of different myths from ancient civilizations. Say, so if you look over there, I got Greek myths, um, Near Eastern myths, British myths. You read those and you really don't get this same kind of of poignant, almost novelistic moments that you find um, in in the Old Testament, um, because these are not myths um, as as we think of them. These these are these are stories of people who lived long ago that are brought to us across the millennia. So verse twelve. So now Joseph is there in front of his father Jacob, um, and he has his two sons. 
so Joseph removes them from Israel's knees, which is where, um, wait, I went ahead too far. No, I didn't. So Joseph has brought the two sons to Jacob, put them on his knees. Jacob has embraced them and kissed them and, and said he never expected to see them, much less Joseph. Okay, so Joseph, verse 12, Joseph removed them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on his right. So we have to imagine this. So, so Joseph has Ephraim on his right in front of Jacob's left hand and Manasseh on his left in front of Jacob's right hand. And he brought the two boys close to Jacob. But when Israel, Jacob, reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, okay, though he was the younger and crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. So, um, the, right, he, the old man has the two sons in front of him, and he crosses his hands, just like this, crosses his hands, in order to put his right hand on the younger son and his left hand on the older son, which is not how it should be. It's not what Joseph wants. Joseph presents the sons. He presents the elder son so that he can be um, blessed by Jacob's right hand and the younger son who would get the blessing through the left hand because Manasseh was the firstborn. Am I picturing that right, honey? Yes, I believe so. Yep, I think so. So then Jacob blessed Joseph, okay, having his hands crossed. And he said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. And may they increase greatly on the earth. So that's a pretty great blessing, isn't it, honey? Yes, it is. They're part of the family, the family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They're part of this family whom God has chosen to be the ones through whom God would bless all the families on earth. Um, and they're going to increase greatly in number, and God is going to be with them. Now, all this is happening, and in verse 17, Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head. He was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's. <laughs> I think Joseph is used to being in charge, don't you think? Oh, well, he was. <laughs> He's been in charge for years. He's yeah. been the, you know, the the go-to guy in Egypt, the Pharaoh's administrator, the right, the chief executive of, you know, the kingdom. So yeah, so he's going to uncross Dad's hands and put them on the correct heads. And Joseph said to his father, No, my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. That would be Manasseh. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He too, Manasseh too, will become a people, and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his descendants will become a group of na nations. So, Wow, okay, so the father, Jacob, is determined. And um, as history unfolds, the truth is that the tribe of Ephraim becomes dominant over the tribe of Manasseh. Met, um, it's Ephraim that, that rises and becomes more powerful. So in a way, this anticipates that, okay? So Jake, Jacob blessed them that day and said, In your name, Will Israel pronounce this blessing? May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So that's a blessing to Israel that, you know, it's a good thing, going to be a good thing if God will bless you like God has blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. So Jacob put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Okay, so like, wow, that's quite a story for the blessing of these two sons who really in the history of Israel, they're just two, we're going to look at this in a minute, but they're just really just two of the tribes. It's not like this is involving Judah, which become the great tribe, the tribe of kings, the tribe from which the Messiah will come. 
No, not that. But nonetheless, it's an important story, I guess, in the history of Israel, this blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh. And you wonder, why did he did he get a sense from God that's what he should do? Obviously, before when he was a young man, he and his mother connived to get the blessing from his brother. And ja Jacob was Esau. the second born son. Yes, and he so stole Esau's blessing. Was Esau, was Isaac the first born son? No, Isaac wasn't the. So this S is kind of one of these things where what, a second son story, right? You have so, right. Yes. Yeah. This is a little bit like the world turned upside down because the in all of these cases, I mean, we say it a lot in Jesus's case, it's going to turn the world upside down, but people were used to this custom of always being the first son. And now, as you're saying... Obviously, they all bought into it, and this is the way it's supposed to be, right. and Joseph feels it so strongly that he's moving dad's hands himself. But it's Abraham's but second it's, son, and then it's... Um, it's the world's Abraham's customs. second son. It's the world's customs. customs. It's the world's traditions, and that's not God's way, right? But it doesn't say here that he was told to do this. Is no, it this doesn't. Is something that maybe Jacob just understood? I mean, he certainly knew that um, Isaac was the second-born son. He knew that he was the he second was the second-born <laughs> son, and you know he carries he carries that on. So, yep. The story of second-born sons. Sorry that you were the first-born son, honey. <laughs> <laughs> I was the first-born son. You didn't son. get the gigantic reaping of blessings yet. <laughs> <laughs> Which of my brothers did, though? None. That's, I don't know. We're all still waiting, I guess. I got you, honey. Oh, that's so true. I got you. Yeah. I got you. <laughs> okay. Verse 21. Then Israel said to Joseph, I am about to die. But God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers, to Canaan. And to you I give one more ridge of land than to your brothers, the ridge I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow. So um, Jake, Joseph's family is going to end up, because they're getting this double portion, a more extensive land than the brothers, the other brothers are. It's There we go. So, you know, these stories we're in right now, we're about in chapter 49, we come to the blessings that Jacob gives his sons. And they are built off of two things. They are built off the family's own experiences and what has happened in the past and how that shapes the sons and how that might shape their descendants and so forth. But it's also built off what will happen when they live in the land of Canaan. And um, these blessings that Jacob is, is giving his sons sort of foreshadow what will happen when they um, uh, occupy the promised land and history and time passes and so forth. But they are also, these stories help to explain to people of their time, the Israelites centuries later, well, why is it that the tribe of Ephraim is is more powerful than the tribe of Manasseh, these two sons to Joseph. And these blessings provide part of that. Why is the tribe of Judah, you know, ascendant over all the other tribes? This helps explain that. So we'll see. In some cases, in some cases, we're not really sure exactly what the blessing to a particular son means. So I want to um, go to my slides for a minute. This is a fairly common painting. Um, I think it was done by uh, the LDS church of the old man blessing the sons. And they're all gathered there. They're all gathered to get their blessings. In this case, the son is whom? And how would we know that? The son is Joseph because he's got some Egyptian-looking garb on, right? So anyway, so um, let me just tell you, this is maybe a funny way to tell you, but let me tell you what's going to happen after Genesis is over, because it ties back to what we're about to do in these blessings to the gathered sons of Jacob. So 
um, obviously the book of Exodus tells the story of the um, the tribes, the Hebrews making their journey, fleeing slavery from Egypt, from the land of Goshen, which is where they will settle, down to Mount Sinai, and where they get the law, and then up to the land of Canaan. And they make a beeline for the land of Canaan. From Mount Sinai, where they get the law and they get the tabernacle, they do not spend 40 years to get to the land of Canaan. They go right there, and when they get to the land of Canaan, they chicken out. That's the basic story. They chicken out. They don't trust God. They want to turn back out of fear. And so God says, well, okay, I'll, well, I'll let you do that. And so you're not going to enter the promised land. Y'all are all dead. <laughs> and your children and grandchildren do because they wander in the wilderness then for 40 years. So I found a couple of maps that depict the wandering. This map is very busy, but you see how that red line keeps wandering all over the place? That is the, um, wow. the, that's the wandering in the wilderness. Here's another map maker's version of it. They go up. You see how the line goes up, up. They get up to Beersheba, just up there to the land of Canaan. They chicken out, and then they're going to spend time wandering around for 40 years. It's really not that they're lost. I mean, this is land that they're familiar with. They traveled through it, okay? But yeah, they're just gonna wander around for 40 years until finally they make their way back up to um, the eastern side of the Jordan River and from there, under the leadership of God and Joshua, cross over the Jordan River into the land of Canaan. When they enter the land of Canaan, they will settle, and God will allot them land. And this map does a nice, neat little job of showing you where all the tribes go. So you can look at, you know, the land allotted to Manasseh, the land given to Ephraim. You would think that it would be Eph Manasseh who would be transcendent, but no, it will be Ephraim who is transcendent. Um, you can see down at the purple is the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Simeon. You can see the little bit given to Benjamin, the tribe of Dan to the, um, you see Dan along the coast there, Joppa and so forth. That is not where they end up staying. They end up migrate. they get chased out by the Philistines basically and end up migrating northward. And so they kind of squeeze themselves in next to the tribe of Naphtali and Manasseh. So, um, this is a, a, a map showing the outlines of the kingdoms of Saul, David, and Solomon, and all the splotches are the different color. But notice that they're not all on the western side of the Jordan River. They're also on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Reuben, Gad, some of Manasseh's tribe, they're on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Um, and notice in particular, the land of Gad is particularly exposed to the, to the tribe of the Ammonites. And so they're going to have issues with them on down the road. So eventually, you know, here's what is left. The green represents the great Assyrian Empire to the north. The little orange and red areas are, are the remaining lands of the tribal lands of um, the descendants of Jacob and of course the Assyrian Empire conquers and wipes out all the northern tribes and they become the lost tribes of Israel all that is in 722 BC which is roughly a more than it's more than a thousand years from the story we're looking at the end of Genesis so it's a thousand years but eventually the ten northern tribes become the lost tribes of Israel so let me go back to this map. You do have a question here from Vicki Scott. Okay. And she's wondering why wasn't the land equally divided among these sons? I would say probably because the tribe, it reflect the tribe's various size and maybe the productivity of the land. So the larger tribes need more land, the smaller tribes need less land. Remember they are move there will be hundreds of years 
hundreds of years that pass from the time we are reading about right now at the end of Genesis to their coming into the um, promised land and beginning to settle there. So it's hundreds of years from the end of Genesis to the beginning of Exodus. And from there, it's decades until they finally enter the promised land. And then you're into the book of Joshua and the book of Judges, which encompass another couple hundred years as they all try to settle. And even when they settle in the land, Vicki, this all looks nice and neat, right? Little boundaries and all this kind of stuff. The reality is the tribes are settling in and amongst the pagan folks who were there. So it's not nearly as neat and tidy as maps depict it, but they give you a general idea of where these tribes are settling. And when the Assyrians in 722 BC roll over all of this, all of those tribes you see, Dan, Ephraim, Manasseh, Gad, Reuben, Issachar, Zebulon, Asher, Naphtali, they're all swept away. The tribe of Simeon is gone by the time you get to that story. And what's left is the tribe of Judah and this tiny remnant called the tribe of Benjamin. But otherwise, all the rest, all the rest are gone. Ten tribes. And they're never, they're never heard from again, right? There's no, they're just gone. It isn't like they are moved somewhere and settled and we're the tribe of Naphtali living here somewhere. Nope, they're pretty much just kind of, it's not like they're all wiped out, but they're removed from the land and just kind of absorbed. And so um, leaving only the tribe of Judah, the kingdom of Judah in the south and a few remnants of the tribe of Benjamin. And that's it. So, and that's the way it will be for um, uh, another 150 years after that until even the tribe of Judah is sent into exile by the Babylonians. So we did all that because Jacob is going to bless his sons and sometimes he's going to look forward and sometimes he's going to look back. Okay? So, any other questions about that, Patty? I can... No, no. <laughs> I see the Riveras are hoping that this miserable weather stays because it makes us all come in and do Bible study, right? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. So, here we go. So Jacob, 49 verse 1, Jacob called for his sons and he said, gather around so I can tell you what will happen to you in days to come. Assemble and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power, turbulent as the waters. Uh unstable as the waters is the way it's sometimes translated. I like unstable a little better because we're going to say, you will no longer excel, he says to his son Reuben, for you went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. So with that said, let's turn back to Genesis 35, 22. Take a moment. We're all here. 35, 22. I'm going to find it in my actual print Bible. Thirty-five twenty-two. It, you know, we've been there obviously, but that is the place. Okay, thirty-five twenty-two. It's in the midst of the telling of the birth of Benjamin and the death of Rachel, verse 22 in chapter 35. While Israel lived in that land, while Jacob lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with, sleep with, have sex with, Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Jacob heard of it. So remember, there was a little passing reference to what the eldest son of Jacob did. He was trying to establish himself against his father, everybody else. And so he went in and claimed his father's concubine and had sex with her. And not did only everybody else know about it, I'm sure, but Jacob found out about it. So, ah. So Reuben, who should be 
the strength of Jacob's hand and he's not. He's too unstable. He You went up under your father's bed onto my couch and defiled it, Jacob tells his son. So you can imagine Reuben kind of slinking away from that one. Don't you think? Oh yeah. Oh man. All right. Simeon and Levi are brothers. There's... I was just going to say something. You kind of wonder all those years if Reuben thought Pop forgot about it. Ah, but no. And in the history of Israel, does the tribe of Reuben amount to anything? No. Nope. Nope. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence, Father says. Let me not enter their council. I don't want their advice. Let me not join their assembly. I don't want that much to do with them. For they have killed men in their anger. So let, they've killed men in their anger. Um, one of the essential teachings of God, one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not kill. Now they haven't been given that, right? They don't have the Ten Commandments yet. But they should understand as their father understands and Isaac before him and Abraham before him that that God is a God of life not a God of death and you remember this story of, of when the, the sister Dinah um, had been raped by a young man um, and though I read the story as they subsequently you know um, uh, wanted to be together Simon and Levi take revenge on the whole village and trick the men in the village to to be to be circumcised, and they're in their weakness as they're recovering from the shock of circumcision. They go in and slaughter them all. That's the story in Genesis 34. We read that story, the story of Dinah and Simeon and Levi, and the revenge that they wreak for the dishonoring of their sister. And actually, I think the way most people read it, you know, it's a you know they dishonor their sister. They 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 take from her what 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 she has. So in any event, father hasn't forgotten about it. Simeon and Levi have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they please. In other words, they also abused animals. They abused animals. They're violent, abusive. Cursed be their angers so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Okay? Okay, please explain that. Okay, so Jacob, you mean that last? I will scatter them in, in Jacob. In Israel. Jacob and Israel are two names that are synonymous. So he's using his name to describe the lands that come. I will scatter them in Israel. Let me the, the way to, this is a good opportunity to talk about Hebrew poetry. Here's how Hebrew poetry works. Well, let's start with how our poetry works. Let's talk about how my favorite poetry works. I need poetry that rhymes. I just do. That's what I think it should do, you know. So I, I kind of like old poetry, I guess, because a lot of new poetry doesn't rhyme at all. But I like old poetry, um, whether it's Ogden Nash's or Longfellow's or wherever it is, where the lines rhyme, you know, like the Ogden Nash's candy is dandy, but liquor is quicker. <laughs> so that that is not PC anymore. But anyway, there you go. So it, so appropriate for I, Bible I, study. I know, I know. He was a funny guy, <laughs> Ogden Nash. But... Um, it rhymes. That is not the case for Hebrew poetry. Never in your Bible is that what the Hebrew writers are working on. They do word play. They even do sound play in their writing. But Hebrew poetry rhymes thoughts. So if you look here, or you look in the Psalms, or you look elsewhere, you get a line, and then the second line repeats this, the idea, but expresses it differently. So... Um, here we have in verse 7 I will scatter them in Jacob I will scatter them in, amongst the tribes and disperse them in Israel same idea expressed two different ways um, 
let me not enter their council, let me not join their assembly. Same idea, two different ways. They've killed men in their angle, they have hamstrung oxen. These are violent men, same idea, two different ways. Not, that's how it is in, 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 Hebrew, in Hebrew poetry. So if you remember that, um, it will tell you one thing for sure, that you have to be careful about reading too much into any one line. Let the two lines work together to tell you what the idea is that the psalmist or the writer is expressing. It's really the two lines together that express the idea that the poet wants us to get. Was that helpful, Miss Patty? Yes. Why do I call you Miss Patty when we're on the phone on, 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 in these classes? I don't know. We talked about that yesterday. We did. I haven't figured it out yet. It's like I'm a nursery <laughs> school teacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe it's because of Miss Rachel with her children's moments. I know. I love her. <laughs> it is a hoot. I will tell you. Yep. Don't you know all those kids love her? Oh, they have to. Run, you can bet on it. Okay, so now we have the blessings um, given to Reuben, the firstborn, Simeon, and Levi. None of those are good, right? Right. Patty, none of those are good. So you can imagine, the other brothers are all standing there thinking, oh, man, what's coming for me? But the next up is Judah. He is the fourthborn. Judah. Your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. See, what's the irony in that? What is the dream that Joseph said back at the beginning? In two different ways. That his brothers and even his father would bow down to him. They would be the stars and he would be the light. And that kind of came to fruition when they got to Egypt. But now it will be Judah, not Joseph, who will be ascendant. Mm -hmm. His tribe. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? Okay, the, there will be this great phrase in the story of Israel, um, the Lion of Judah. The Lion of Judah. It expresses the strength and the power of, of, of Israel. Because Judah becomes, in essence, the only tribe left. Okay, and so, and, and it is such, a, the tribe of Judah is so powerful and so dominant that when the tribes of Israel divide the kingdom into two chunks, the northern kingdom, which takes the name Israel. The southern kingdom just takes the name of that one tribe. We refer to our um, friends from as um, our Jewish friends as well as Jewish, as Jews. Where did that name come from? From the name of this tribe. In the Roman province was called Judea. Where does that name come from? This one tribe. That is how ascendant the tribe of Judah becomes. And um, in the book of Revelation, there is this powerful moment in the fifth chapter where, where John is observing what is happening in the throne room of God. And God ha is holding in his hand a scroll sealed with seven seals. And all of the heavens are weeping. Everybody's weeping because there's no one worthy to open, to start opening these seals. And one of the elders comes over to John and he says, ah, there is one worthy, the Lion of Judah. And so John expects to see this mighty, powerful Lion of Judah expressing all the powerful, all the power of Israel, um, all the strength of David. But instead, he sees a lamb that looks as if it had been slaughtered. And the lamb comes over, and the lamb takes the scroll and begins to open the seals because the lamb is worthy. The lamb is worthy. The great closing chorus in Handel's Messiah is, worthy is the lamb that was slain. 
and there's this great image of the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God um, from Revelation 5. For me, one of the most powerful moments in Scripture. Yes, Scott, the right. same thing for me. Every time I hear it, yeah. um, I don't think it will bring up the same emotion, but it does. And I find myself almost weepy. You kind of kind of get goosebumps. You do. Because John turns so and he, ex powerful. he expects to... He's heard about the lion. He expects to see the lion, but he hears about the lion and sees the lamb. This bloody lamb. Yeah. It, yeah. Who is worthy. So, very powerful, and it goes back right here. Okay, this is really where it begins. Um, Judah has been ascendant in the story, um, in the book of Genesis, in the chapters leading up to this. He's, but But now it's clear that he will be, his tribe will be the ascendant tribe. And look how the, the blessing is not over. Um, and we we probably have to reel in a little bit our Jesus stuff here because it's very easy to see this as completely messianic and all about Jesus, and that's probably going too far. Okay. Um, I, I, so verse ten, the scepter, that's what that's what kings hold, will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nation shall be his. Now, do I hear Jesus in that? I do. Did the Jews of Jesus' day see this as messianic? Uh, not to my knowledge. Because it speaks of the kings of Judah, right? Um, King David is the one that is... is um, from the tribe of Judah, and David is the one to whom God makes the extravagant promise about somebody from his family always sitting on the on the throne. Um, verse eleven: He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine. He will be rich, rich, rich. He can wash his garments. No, not that you'd want to. Maybe in a white wine. His robes in the blood of grapes. See, that poetry thing again. It's two lines, same idea. His eyes will be darker than wine. His teeth whiter than milk. Not only be, he will he be rich, but he will be really, really good looking. It's just a way of talking about the, that's the word I've been using, the ascendance of the tribe of Judah. Um, dark, it, rich, Good looking, beauty, wealth, um, royalty, uh, strong, the lion, all of it. And so it's you can imagine Judah standing there and hearing this because his the three preceding brothers have all gotten blessings that would hardly be called a blessing, right? But Judah is. And so you leave this this passage understanding that it will be the tribe of Judah. That, that over the long haul will be in view as, you know, the tribe of Israel. So, um, <laughs> I just saw that Andy Ibsen said, I call you Miss Patty because you're from the South, where Miss Patty would be very normal. There we go. All right, friends, so let's go on. We've done blessings. Now let's do Zebulun. Zebulun will live by the seashore and become a haven for ships. His border will extend toward Sidon, which is on the coastline, the Mediterranean coast up there north of Canaan. Issachar is a raw-boned donkey lying down among the sheep pens. Um, Terence Fretheim suggests that this is perhaps because of some, you know, uh, uh, difficulty with Issachar's neighbors, the other tribes. Right. Going on with Issachar, when he sees how good is his resting place and how pleasant is his land, he would bend his shoulder to the burden and submit to forced labor. Okay. Dan. Dan will provide justice for his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan will be a snake by the roadside, a viper along the path. 
that bites the horse's heels so that its rider tumbles backward. Wow, that's mysterious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, again, one of my go-to Old Testament guys, Fredheim, says, look, Daniel's going to provide justice, but it's going to be done sporadically. Like a, like, a, like a snake on the roadside who just kind of jumps out, does its thing, and then falls backward. Maybe that is what Jacob has in mind. I don't know. I think that some of these blessings are clearer and some of them are less clear. Um, uh, but in any event... And now Jacob just simply says, I look for your salvation, your deliverance, Lord. Okay, so it's Jacob, just a quick prayer. Then he goes on with more of his sons. Gad will be attacked by a band of raiders, but he will attack them at their heels. Gad is on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and the Ammonites and this tribe will have their difficulties, and so they will be subject to being raided, and that's probably it. Asher's food will be rich. He will provide delicacies fit for a king. Okay, so maybe they become the, you know, the breadbasket. Again, the next one, Fred, I'm just kind of honestly throws his hands up. Naphtali is a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. Not sure what that is getting at, but it's got to be good, I guess, right? I wouldn't mind being a doe set free. Well, I, I'm a guy. So, but Patty, maybe she wouldn't mind being a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. I mean, she did have Robbie. So, <laughs> you can tell Robbie. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility. But his bow remained steady. His strong arms stayed limber. Because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast and womb your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the age-old hills. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. Wow. No wow. question who dad's <laughs> no, favorite is. Yes. No question. <laughs> I love you all. I love but... you all, but this guy is Joseph. And he's getting wow. a double portion of the land, and he gets this big extensive blessing that's poured out on him. And notice at the beginning how, how Jacob acknowledges that he was really attacked by his brothers, right? I'm going to knock over my light here. Go back up to um, verse 23. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility, but did they prevail? Oh, no, they did not prevail. His bow remained steady. His strong arm stayed limber. Why? Because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob. So, in a way, the blessing reflects, you know, the theology of this whole portion of Genesis. That, yes, Jacob was sent into slavery, but it wasn't his end. And indeed, he grew to be this administrator of Egypt and the savior of the family. And why did all that, why did that happen? Why did he rise to such prominence? Because of his own innate abilities? No. Because of God. Because of what God did for him. God gave him the ability to interpret dreams. God gave him the ability to be a good administrator. The hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you. That's why. That's what the story of Joseph is about. It isn't really about what Joseph does. It is about what God does. And that's a big, really, it's a big piece of, of theology. God is not in control of everything that happens in this world. There are such things as gravity and the rest, you know. If, 
Um, there are germs and there's all kinds of things in this world. But God's purposes move forward. God works through the natural processes of the world that he created through all of us in such a way that God's purposes roll forward. So that's that's what has happened. That's what has happened here. And Joseph is the recipient of the work that God has been doing to save the family so that the promise made to Abraham would continue to move forward toward what we know will be its climax, which is the incarnation, the birth of Christ. And um, so, but it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't mean that God made the brothers sell Joseph into slavery. That can't be what it is. God doesn't cause people to commit evil, to commit wrong, but God can work even with that, even with that such that God's purposes will roll, will roll forward. And that's what makes God, God. Okay, we have one brother left. And that is little Benjamin. <laughs> Call him little Benjamin. He is the baby of the 12. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey. In the evening, he divides the plunder. Well, the tribe of Benjamin is going to have a lot of problems going forward, especially in the book of Judges. They are end up being relegated to insignificance, really, among the tribes. But, you know, this is a blessing of strength, I suppose. Verse 28. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is what their father said to them when he blessed them, given each the blessing appropriate to him, to Jacob. He gave them each the blessing that he that was appropriate as far as Jacob was concerned. It started badly with Reuben and then with Simeon and Levi, but you had this big long blessing given to Judah and the big long blessing giving given to Joseph. So, any questions about those blessings, Patty? I just, I just have one. Yeah. Um, I'm a tiny bit confused because I know that this is naming all of Jacob's actual sons that a wife or concubine bore for him. Before them. Where do we get that Levi doesn't get any land and the Manasseh and Ephraim, that they, they fill in those spots. Well, we've Joseph. gotten already that they get their portion. So you would think right now what's going to happen is there's going to be 13 tribes. Right, yes. But in the law of Moses, it stipulates that the tribe of Levi will not have land, that they will, that there will be a tithe collected from the other tribes to support the tribe of Levi, who will be the tribe of priests. And they, don't have, they are not given an allotment of land. So if we go to my handy little slides here of the 12, 12 tribes, you won't find one called the tribe of Levi. You will one called Simeon and Naphtali and Manasseh and Gad and all the rest, but not Levi. That comes out of the law of Moses, which they will get at Mount Sinai. So that's how the 13 becomes 12. Okay. okay. Is that helpful? Yes. So Levi doesn't know yet that they're not going to get an allotment. But of those allotments of land, um, that's all still to come. It's really, that's, that's another point to bring out. It is really at Mount Sinai, when they gather at the foot of Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, that God begins to truly form them into a people. Right and 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 gives them, teaches them a law to hold them together, and the allotment of lands. Yes, Patty. Vicky Deering is asking which tribe is Jesus from. Um, Jesus has a legal claim on the tribe of Judah, because 
which is the tribe of David. Through his father, Joseph. Alrighty. When we get to Jesus' day, almost everybody you meet is from the tribe of Judah. Because the tribe of Benjamin is not of much consequence. So why is everybody from the tribe of Judah? Because 10 tribes were basically dispersed and wiped out by the Assyrians 700 years before Jesus. And so... Now, I get, you know, I have no idea what DNA tests would show, you know, of whether people from those lost tribes ended up making their way back to Judea, but that probably did, but they never are constituted again as a tribe. They are really, that's why in the New Testament, you don't find a lot, a lot of tribal references or anything, because they're really, they're really simply God's people. And the name that they carry um, in the eyes of the world are the Jews, named after this one tribe of Judah. So what the Assyrians do and what the Babylonians do and the vast passage of time just creates a different situation when you come to Jesus' day. Because um, we do have to remember, you know, when, when these stories we've been doing in Genesis, they are from a time nearly as long before Jesus as we are after Jesus. Right? right. Nearly two millennia before Jesus. Uh, maybe 1,800 years before Jesus. 1,900 years before Jesus. Um, God comes to Abraham. So the passage of time is just, you know, it's immense. It's immense. Easy for us to kind of shrink it all down into, into not much. Okay, so the death of Jacob. Then Jacob gave his sons these instructions. I am about to be gathered to my people, and he's about to die. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite. The cave in the field of Machpelah, near Mamre and Canaan, which Abraham bought along with the field as a burial place, and he bought it from Ephron the Hittite. And way earlier in Genesis, we had that whole story of Abraham buying that field from the Hittite, Ephron. Verse 31, there Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. We didn't know all of this. And there I buried Leah. Rachel is not buried there. Rachel's tomb is, is um, near Bethlehem. This is not, this is further west. The field and the cave in it were bought from the Hittites. So Jacob expects that when the family returns to the land of Canaan, they will take Jacob's body with them and they will bury him in that same field, that same cave that Abraham had bought. Where Ab right? Mm -hmm. So, of course, what's going to happen, actually? When We're not far from the end of the book of Genesis. When the book of Genesis ends, it kind of all goes quiet. And when the book of Exodus opens, a lot of time has passed, and the family is still in Egypt. If all you had was the book of Genesis, you would think that, well, okay, they're going to be able to kind of, kind of quickly head out and make their way back to, to Israel. But, but, but no, that's not going to be the case. They are not going to get back to Canaan. Any, it will be centuries before they are back in the land of Canaan. When Jacob had finished giving instructions to his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed. <laughs> right? So that painting that had Joseph kind of sitting on the edge of the bed doing all of this, 
he sort of lays back down and he pulls his feet up under the covers, right? Breathed, breathed his last and was gathered to his people, which is an elegant way of saying he, he, he died. He breathed his last and was gathered to his people. You know, it, my mind is reflecting on the truth that we, you know, we will all die unless Jesus comes back first. But when we pass, we, we don't just pass into the arms of Jesus. We pass into the whole cloud of witnesses, right? All of God's people from time past and time, and really in a way those to come, but certainly with those past. And so we are gathered to our people as well because our first identity is not to our blood family, it's not to America, it's not to humanity in general. Our family, our first family is Jesus' family. And when we pass, we will be gathered to those people, which we could express as elegantly as the writer does here when he says that Jacob breathed breathed his last and was gathered to his people. So um, we're going to stop there. Um, it's a good stopping place. And when we come back next week, we will finish up the book of Genesis. We will um, look at chapter 50. And there is another big moment in here because I'll just tease it a little bit. When the old man dies... When Jacob dies, after all of this elevation of Joseph, what do you think some of the brothers might be thinking? What do some of the brothers might be thinking lies in store for them now that the old man is gone? So when you come back next week, we will do that. And in two weeks, we will begin Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So... Any closing thoughts or questions for anybody, honey? Nope. We're, we're good. Okay. So my closing thought is just really get used to thinking of all of the big time frames involved here. They're all kind of neatly connected in a bound little, bound little Bible like this, right? But actually getting to know the timeline is important because it helps prepare you for for. The big changes is you go from one section of scripture to another section as you're kind of working through this story. It's a lot of time is, is passing. The places of names change. Um, the focus of people changes over time. So anyway, we'll do all of that Vicky next has week. one last question yes. for you. She's asking, um, how many years between when Jacob hmm. now dies and Moses? Exodus just says a very long time. A couple hundred so, years. Yeah. So I usually read it as 200 years, 300 years. You know, people don't really agree. People don't agree about when the Exodus happened. Some say it happened maybe 1,500 years before Jesus. Some say no, more like 1,200 years. We just don't get enough time markers to know. One last piece. We really don't get good time markers until the time of David and thereafter. That is when you start to get enough historical markers with surrounding um, nations to really begin to pin down dates. Before that, the dates are problematic. And I, I know just not that long ago, there actually became some kind of true reference to the city of David, where before... We in about, about 1990, they found what's called a stele. A stele was an ancient stone that would be stood up and carry markings on it. And they found one up at Dan, far in the north, that had the name House of David on it. And that was the first archaeological reference we had found specifically to David. That's Which amazing. is, let me just do one other thing before we close. I just want to leave it with that. The problem with archaeology is that they've uncovered a tiny, 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 tiny portion of what could be dug, just in terms of how much they dig. And of what they've dug, 
they've only actually studied a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of that. So using archaeology to prove the Bible or disprove the Bible or something, is uh, that's a project fraught with problems because right. it's just most of what we of what was once there is either gone because it wasn't permanent rock is permanent papyrus is not permanent or it's um just hasn't been found so anyway what last, the, last last speech for this uh, morning well that's what the blessing of the dead sea scrolls were yeah that they were intact in these caves yeah. uh, in jars i mean it's that is like really a miracle in itself it is it really is it is so Anyway, okay. we're going to close. Thank you guys for Thank you for being with us on this us today, cold, rainy day. Cold, rainy day. And a week from today, of course, is election day. So, just my little plug. I hope everybody has gotten out and voted. If you could, I know early voting, I believe, is till this Friday. And um, we voted here in Frisco. It was about a 45-minute wait. I've heard other people are in and out in five minutes. But anyway, hope you will... Hope you will take the time to vote this year. Just it's important. Let's remember, blue and red, we're all Jesus' people. Absolutely. So That's what I was going to say. Keep perspective to Absolutely. things, right? Absolutely. Um, it's just like what Paul said, you know, free or slave, Gentile or Jew. We add in so many other things to it, you know, black or white or gay or straight or Republican or Democrat. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And half of our country is going to be really disappointed when somebody is elected, and the other half are going to be really joyful. And I just have to stop and think sometimes the person I want has won, and it's been wonderful. And many times the person I didn't want won. And you know what? Like the world still it goes keeps on going. the next day, and we're all still friends. and. God still loves every one of us, and Jesus still died for every one of us. It it just gets to be such a crazy time of it year is. in so many, so many crazy ways, especially on social media. And um, anyway, so we're praying for a clean election next week. We are praying God truly for this vaccine. Oh, we've been hearing about it for months, and we know this has been expedited like nothing ever before in our history. And we just pray for it to be safe and effective because right now we would never believe eight months ago that our no, country would be in the same position as we were then. So anyway, just join me as I close briefly in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for bringing all of us together again today on this cold, wet Tuesday. And we're blessed to be inside, Lord, protected and warm we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will lift up the prayers of each person that's gathered here today, prayers of joy, prayers of concern, and lift them up directly to you, Lord. We are a very grateful people, Lord. We forget about that sometimes. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves a few times throughout the day, and we pray, God. We just pray, Lord, for our country. We pray, God, for this world. We pray, God, for your son Jesus to come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And we lift all these prayers, Lord, up to you. In the name of your risen Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Adios. Bye, everybody. Next we love time, you guys. Love you guys. Next time we're up is on Sunday morning at 11 <gasps> o'clock. We'll be talking about Karl Marx. Yes, religion and as the opiate of the hour. masses. We get an extra hour. An extra I'm going to be really sharp next Sunday. You're going to be super sharp. <laughs> love you guys. Bye-bye. Have a good day.